Uh, what we're focused on is, is what matters, and what matters is original research to find new alpha sources and you know improve our existing ones, and on risk management. And um, you know th those are exactly the two things you mentioned. So uh, we've got a, a really uh, exciting uh, research department and research process, and there's a, there's a huge amount going on uh, all the time, both in our trend, in our in our systematic macro, and across our multi-strategy uh, hedge fund with the, the long-short equities and, and the credits as well. And at the same time, you know, our approach to risk management is, is, is the one I mentioned of hypervigilance and uh, monitoring a whole array of possible scenarios and situations that, that could come up. Um, so that's, that's what we think is important for 2023 and that, that's what we're going to continue to do. Imagine spending an hour with the world's greatest traders. Imagine learning from their experiences, their successes, and their failures. Imagine no more. Welcome to Top Traders Unplugged, the place where you can learn from the best hedge fund managers in the world so you can take your manager due diligence or investment career to the next level. Before we begin today's conversation, remember to keep two things in mind. All the discussion we will have about investment performance is about the past, and past performance does not guarantee or even infer anything about future performance. Also understand that there's a significant risk of financial loss with all investment strategies, and you need to request and understand the specific risks from the investment manager about their product before you make investment decisions. Here's your host, veteran hedge fund manager, Niels Kostrup Larsen. Hey everyone, and welcome to another edition of Top Traders Unplugged, where today Alan Dunn and I are joined by Simon Jutes, Co-Chief Investment Officer at Winton, as part of our mini-series focusing on the one investment strategy that beat everything else in 2022, namely trend following and manage futures more broadly. First off, Simon, it is really great to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for joining us today. We really have been looking forward to our conversation. How are you doing? I guess you're in London. I am in London. Yeah, I'm doing very well. Thank you. and Thank you very much for inviting me on. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, before we dive into the various different topics, um, maybe it's a good idea to always set the stage for our conversation so that the audience knows a little bit of background, so to speak, to Winton, even though I'm sure most people will be familiar with with uh, Winton. But maybe you could share just a few highlights as to the type of strategies you focus on nowadays and also maybe where the business stands as we've entered into 2023. Absolutely. Um, Winton is a systematic hedge fund um, founded 25 years ago by David Harding. Um, we employ about 200 people and we, we manage uh, 10 billion in AUM. Um, we've got three types of products. There's a quant uh, multi-strategy hedge fund. Um, there's a diversified CTA, which is three quarters trend following and a quarter other systematic macro strategies. And then we have uh, pure trend products as well. Um, so that, that's where the, the business stands right now. Yeah, yeah, and just out of curiosity, when when did you join uh, Winton? Uh, almost fifteen years ago, actually. I, I joined wow. uh, in July of two thousand eight, which was a great time to <laughs> to start in the industry and, and learning about markets. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. It's funny. I've always, uh, I, I started uh, sort of my first touch with real finance was in around September 1987. And uh, I think some some people have said that you kind of get shaped a little bit in terms of the timing you enter an industry. Um, so in my case, probably a little bit more risk uh, averse than uh, other people because of what happened. So uh, I don't know if you've had any, any um, if, if you ever thought about that, actually, whether the timing of joining the CTA industry was... In sort of impacted you in some ways? It d definitely, yeah. I, I mean, it, it affected uh, David himself too, because um, he founded, uh, co-founded AHL um, at, the, at the very similar time in the 80s um, to when you mentioned and traded through 1987. And then that was obviously a formative experience. Um, I started in, in 2008. Um, and then you could look at other uh, firms that started um, after um, 2008. And you can see uh, that that led them often to make different decisions um, around um, how they parameterize their trend strategies and how they organize them. And uh, I, I definitely agree, people have been very influenced by their initial experiences. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's a great point. I'm sure we'll dig into that a little bit later. And and yes, I do remember actually uh, David talking about that when I sat down with him and his co-founders of AHL a few years ago in Abbey Road Studios. And it was quite fun to celebrate their 30th anniversary of, of founding AHL uh, by bringing them together so people can go and find that 
uh, on the website, and they should definitely listen to that three-part conversation. It's certainly one of the most memorable that I've had uh, in the last eight or nine years. Anyways, enough of this. Uh, we do want to get to the meat of it. And uh, Simon, as we normally do, um, we uh, kind of share different topics uh, between Alan and me. And uh, as usual, he always has uh, first choice. So I'm going to send it over to you, Alan, and uh, see where we're going. Thanks, Jules. Uh, Simon, uh, good to speak to you. Um, yeah, you, you, in your opening description, you, you touched on a couple of um, uh, features of us or of Winton's trading: um, systematic, diversified quant strategies with an emphasis on trend. So, if you were to wrap all of that up into um, an investment philosophy that underpins everything, uh, what would you say that is? Well, our philosophy is that you can discover and improve uh, successful investment strategies by applying empirical scientific research methods. Um, and, you know, the key thing there is to approach markets um, with an open mind rather than with uh, preconceived ideas and theories um, about how markets are supposed to behave. Obviously, this is very strongly related to David's initial experiences in, in founding AHL and then Winton, where the preconceived idea that many people had was uh, the efficient market hypothesis. And that was um, a bit of a headwind uh, for, for many years because uh, many people just believed that um, implicitly. Um, and clearly the foundation of, um, of our, our strategies and our research process is that that uh, hypothesis is not right um, and that you can, uh, through very hard work and scientific analysis, uh, make good predictions about what markets are going to do. And when you say um, scientific analysis, is that, I mean, is the process then kind of formulating hypotheses and, and rejecting them or not? Or, or is it or more da data mining? Uh, or how would you describe the application of, of that scientific approach? Well, data mining is kind of a pejorative term uh, very often because what it suggests is that you sort of root around uh, looking in data until you uh, you find something and that thing you find is, is probably at that point just a random uh, you know, fluctuation which, which doesn't reflect reality and isn't, isn't predictive of the future. So obviously, what one of the key uh, scientific uh, techniques you, you have to think about is how you're going to avoid falling into that trap. Um, so a lot of our uh, processes um, and thoughts are, are about having a collective understanding of the relevant statistical techniques that help you, um, in particular, test multiple hypotheses at the same time, and uh, sometimes also sequentially one after the other. Um, so that is a technical um, level of competence that's that's required in the organization and that affects um, things like who you hire and how you train people and so on. And some of it is also about process, um, avoiding uh, situations where uh, researchers privately overfit ideas and, and data line and then only show you a, a subset that looked good uh, in a back test. So there are, there are different aspects to it, but that's that's what it looks like in practice. Yeah. So put it, I mean, more simply, I mean, I, I guess some people will have the idea that when they develop a strategy, they have to have an idea about how markets operate and why that might work. And you're kind of saying, well, that may not be your approach if you have sufficient um, technical, I, I suppose, or maybe statistical um, evidence that something is working. You, you, you'd be happy to, to go with a strategy like that. Is that fair enough? Well, well, look, what are you trying to do at the end of the day? You've, you've got a, um, a strategy and you're trying to improve it. You can improve it by adding a new signal. And suppose you come up with something you want to have some confidence that this thing is actually going to improve your your strategy. And what is it you need confidence in? You need confidence that its sharp ratio is is good and is what you think it is, and that its correlation with your existing strategies is is low enough. So how can you get that confidence? Well, one way is by looking at um, a back test um, and analyzing it and seeing if statistically speaking it 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 does um, actually make the improvement that you think. But there are um, other ways that you can also get more confidence. If there is, for example, an economic rationale behind uh, a particular idea, then you can use that. You can test the intermediate economic relationships, and that can add additional uh, confidence to your assessment. And that's great if you can do that. There's, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that, and you should do it. But if you can't do it, it doesn't mean that you have to throw away the idea altogether. Um, it just means perhaps you have slightly less confidence about it. Yeah. And I mean, if you were to describe the sources of opportunity you're capitalizing on now, I mean, I think probably started in the trend following space. But I mean, in terms of where these opportunities arise, is it down to behavioral issues or economic relationships or kind of market microstructure, people trading at certain times because they have to, that type of thing? Or, or how would you describe, like, I mean, basically, who's on the other side to, to the winning trades for, for Winton? 
It, it's a real mixture. I, I mean, and it depends a lot on, you know, exactly which types of strategy you're looking at. And as I mentioned at the beginning, um, in addition to our CTA and trend strategies, we have a, a quant multi-strat hedge fund where we trade uh, long-short equity strategies. And um, more recently, we trade long-short uh, credit strategies as well. Um, so there's an extremely diverse uh, collection of, of alpha sources. Uh, it's, it's very hard to generalize about who, who in general is on the other side. Yeah, I want to stay with the investment philosophy a little bit. And uh, I think our in, in, listeners would be a little bit disappointed if I didn't address uh, one particular kind of question in terms of the findings that you came out with a few years ago, or in specifically David came out with a few years ago, where he, it, 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 as I remember it, uh, it was along the lines that perhaps uh, you didn't feel that the trend was necessarily um, as strong a, a strategy as it had been in the past. So I'm, I'm curious about if you can talk a little bit about how that came about in a sense, what was it that that alerted to you uh, or alerted you to kind of draw that conclusion or led you to draw that conclusion at the time? But also, um, as I understand it, um, you've, you've changed your view on this. Um, and so I'd love to hear what changed your minds kind of coming back into the full trend fold, if, if I can phrase it like that. Sure, yeah. I, I don't think we've really changed our view in, in any important sense. Um, I think, obviously, um, you know, David is perhaps the, the preeminent trend follower in the world, so there's a, a slight tendency to sometimes overreact to, uh, to comments that he makes. I think what he actually said uh, in 2018 is, is pretty uncontroversial, actually. You know, he said that the long-term sharp outlook for trend following is, is perhaps around a half, um, and that on its own, um, that's scarcely good enough to, to run a hedge fund on. And if, if you really want to maximize the sharp ratio, then you want to look at adding other things too. You know, in terms of w what analysis led up to that, it, it's pretty straightforward, actually. You know, you look at the performance of trend following over time. L lots of people, when they do this, tend to focus on the period after the financial crisis and they say, oh, it didn't work as well after the financial crisis as it did before. But actually, um, if you look over a much longer time horizon, you know, starting in the 70s, which is the, the point where um, a strategy like that became tradable in, in, in the modern form, um, then you actually find a consistent decline in the performance of, of, of trend, um, of the kind of trend strategies that people were trading at the time um, over the years. So uh, we first observed that in, in our research in around 2007, um, bef before I even joined the firm, it, it was already uh, well understood. So the, the comments that um, that Dave was making are uh, were based on you know that research that that we'd done a long time ago, and it, that trend of um, decreasing performance had, had just continued, and it had, it had got to the point where we we felt that the long term outlook was was at that level um, around a half. Nothing has changed in that recently. Trend has uh, always been our biggest strategy, and um, it still is. And um, you know the main thing that's that's changed for us is that instead of having one product uh, dominated by trend following, we now have three products, um, some of which are pure trend and some of which have um, a much lower allocation to trend following. Okay, yeah, no, that's a great segue. I appreciate that, and I completely agree that sometimes things can get a little bit, uh, you know, misinterpreted uh, by 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 media. Although I will say, Simon, that uh, I have to say uh, it certainly caused a little bit of a challenge uh, for 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 me, and I'm sure for others, because as soon as people came out, or someone like David with his stature came out saying, "Well, maybe the trend is not as good as it used to be," um, we we had to work a little bit harder to uh, to keep them to keep them interested. I have to say, but anyways. You you talk about different strategies. You talk about pure trend versus let's call it diversified trend. And one of the topics that we've been talking to uh, all our friends about is really um, partly captured in this paper that Cliff Asnes came out with uh, last year, where he talked about um, you know what's the mandate? Is it dual? Um, you know, absolute return as well as quote unquote crisis alpha, and also whether we as firms uh, have kind of become too focused on on the sharp. You know, at least sharp as a line item, because of course it was not really created for for that purpose. And and maybe we need to. And I'm not sure they said that, but my opinion is we probably should change the conversation to talk about the improvement of portfolio sharp that these strategies provide, uh, and so on and so forth. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about uh, some of these um, comments and observations that uh, that AQR came out with last year. Well, on the one hand, you can see that 
we have both products in our staple. We have a pure trend product and we have a diversified product. So in, in, a, in a sense, we're, we're being open-minded about that. Um, I think the, the focus on the mandate or, or the, the sharp um, is probably not quite the right angle to look at. I, I think we prefer to look at the investor experience. You look at uh, situations where investors really needed diversification in 2008, uh, last year, and trend has done very well there and it's provided that diversification. And obviously that's not guaranteed for the future, but nevertheless, it has done that in the past. Um, but what's also true is that in the intervening periods, there've been large drawdowns and it's been quite hard for many investors to remain allocated in those periods. And it's important, um, I think, to understand that that's not a, um, a, a criticism or a sign of, of, of weakness or something like that or an inability to keep the faith. It's totally natural and understandable because the people who are making these allocation decisions have to justify each line item to, the, to their investment committees. And it, it becomes very difficult um, to do that. And so um, there's great value in adding signals which smooth out those drawdowns and obviously uh, still preserve the behavior of trend following um, at other times, like in, in, in those moments like 2008 and, and last year. Um, it's not uh, definitely a trade-off in the way that, that I think um, the Fastness describes in that if you add other signals, you necessarily reduce the effectiveness in, in those periods. Um, you just have to be a bit careful about what kind of other signals you add and also how much weight you give to them. So from our point of view, that, that's why we stick with three quarters trend following because we think that's the right level where you get this drift that helps with the drawdowns, um, but you retain the, the classic trend following profile. Yeah, we uh, recently published a conversation with Katie Kaminsky and uh, where she kind of reminded us a little bit about how this crisis alpha term came about. And uh, I don't know if you listened to it. Maybe I'll ask you, did you happen to listen to that one, Simon? I, I didn't. I, I thought it came about when she wrote a book with the uh, crisis alpha in the title. Right. Okay. So okay. So then I have to give you a little bit of a context here because I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Because initially, when you just hear the words crisis alpha, you think about it's a strategy that can create create some kind of positive performance during a crisis. That's kind of you know. But then you know, after a, a, a few months of people gravitating towards this term in two thousand and nine, and you know, it became this constant debate. Uh, about was it a crisis or was it not a crisis and did you perform did you not perform but in our conversation with Katie which I encourage people to go and listen to she actually says well that's not exactly what uh, was said back then because it came from a question of a pension fund saying why do these strategies perform well during stress and she basically said well because there are three elements or characteristics that you need one they need to be liquid so you can move your you know in and out of your exposure efficiently and and, and quickly two uh it needs to have um you know it needs to be opportunistic so that you you don't you're not stuck in the same asset class or in the same market you can move around to where the action is where the opportunities are and three it should have no bias you know it, it could be long as easily as it's short and of course, uh, a good example of that would be that in 2020, during COVID, the best trade was long bonds and short energy. But in 2022, it was exactly the opposite. So uh, I'm just curious to um, to know what what whether this term crisis alpha, you think it's helpful, what value you give it, or, or how would you explain it if different? Uh, just because I think it's something that has really stuck in our industry, but maybe some of it has been kind of lost in translation, so to speak. I, th I think it's, um, you know, those three characteristics that, that you mentioned are prerequisites for something to function in that way, but they don't guarantee that it's going to work. You know, for example, a strategy that had precisely the opposite positions to trend following would also be liquid, uh, opportunistic, and not have a long bias. Um, but it wouldn't work in those in those situations. Um, so it's it, it's right, but it but it's not enough. Obviously, that you know the historical record of trend following is what it is. It has performed well in those situations, and you can see why. You can see that um, if there is going to be an extended trend, then trend following will uh, latch onto it and do well in that environment. Equally. You can imagine scenarios where there's a crisis where a trend following gets it wrong. For example, if the equity market is steadily moving upwards and then has a very sharp uh, downturn. That's a situation like perhaps in February 2018 where trend following is not going to do well. So how do you then react to a term like, uh, like crisis alpha as a characterization of the strategy? 
well, obviously, it, it's not uh, very good as a you know as a pure description of, of of the strategy because sometimes it will work in that way and other times it won't. So, I, you know, from our point of view, the best thing is to really try and describe the strategy, how it's going to react, what it's going to do in different environments, and we don't then need to apply uh, labels like that, uh, which you know have the potential to mislead. Yeah. Okay, that's a fair point. Um, now, um, before I turn it back to you, Alan, sorry, I'm taking up a little bit of extra time um, with this segment, but I do want to just also ask you a little bit of a uh, of, of good advice from you, Simon, and that is, you know, I've been out traveling quite a lot so far this year, and a lot of what I hear from investors, um, you know, not necessarily current investors, but certain potential investors, is they they kind of look at trend following a little bit like a trade. They try to time it. And then also they have this notion that, well, it did so well in 2022. Um, it's either too late or certainly it can't do well in 2023, so to speak. So I'm just curious. I mean, you you guys are the masters uh, of putting out uh, great papers and, and write-ups and, and so on and so forth. H- how would you... How would you, if you had to, how would you change those kind of observations from from people looking at the 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 strategy? How could we not make them look at this as a as a trade, or even have a a preconceived notion about what we're gonna do um, going forward in an unpredictable future with a strategy that just adapts to whatever happens? How how do we change that? Well, it's a great question, um, and it's obviously what's on people's minds. I, I mean, again, I think it, it's. Um, it's it's useful to be sympathetic to the in, investor concerns, because even if you um, can't time trend following, even if we agree that you can't time when it's going to work, there's still um, a risk for the allocator that they make a decision, and then immediately afterwards it does badly, and that that carries a risk, uh, you know, for them personally o- over and above um, the long term performance of the of the strategy. And it's important to sort of be aware of that and not just reply with a series of statistical observations, um, which, which don't really address uh, what's on their mind. Our view is, uh, you know, as, as, as you say, I think that, um, that there's no reason to think that next year will be, um, will be bad because last year was good. 2008 was a good year, but every year of Winton's history prior to that had also been a good year. So you often get these long sequences of, of, of good years. But to the extent that people are worried about the risk of allocating at a particular point and then subsequently having an underperformance, one uh, mitigant is that you can average your way in um, over over a number of months. And that that's sometimes um, quite helpful as, as an idea because that, that often addresses the, uh, the real underlying concern. Just to, to pick up on, on a few points that came out of that that, that discussion, and maybe um, maybe firstly, just in relation to you mentioned your diversified CTA, three quarters trend, one quarter non trend. It's good to get a sense of, of what's in in the non trend, and uh, and specifically, you know, the point or you, you mentioned, you know, uh, around the Cliff Asness article, uh, it matters which types of strategies that you add. Yeah, so good to get a sense. Uh, and one thing from that perspective is obviously. You know, if if you're using um, strategies that are more economically related and and slower moving, you know, obviously is that is that a risk uh, it, w- when you're thinking about um, the, you know re- reactivity in crisis periods? Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, often the question of uh, this convexity and whether you whether you lose it with these other strategies centers around carry, because uh, that's that's one of the most common additions um, that, that people add, and we we trade it too. We don't trade it on um, equities, um, though, because often that, that does just add a, a long bias to your equity portfolio, which is, is not what, um, which definitely reduces that uh, uh, element of convexity in the trend side. The other point about carry is that um, a lot of people's ideas about its properties come from its history as a currency strategy. Um, and it's certainly true that um, specifically focusing on currencies, you get small gains followed by, uh, by large losses. Um, but that actually is is uh, mitigated um, very significantly when when you do it in commodities and, and in fixed income as well. Um, so that that's our approach there. The other strategies in there are a real mixture of other things. Some of them are purely statistical in nature. Some of them have economic rationales. Some of them are other uh, technical signals like trend following, but but different from trend following. Um, and you know some of them are a bit faster. There's a lot of research going on there as well. Um, so we, you know, we've added several new signals in in the last year. Um, 
And, and in terms of the kind of uh, three quarters, one quarter mix, why have you landed on that as the sweet spot? I guess it's to deliver more consistent returns, but maintaining the profile. But, you know, any, any reason why it's not two thirds, one third or 80, 20? Is, 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 uh, any, any observations around that? Well, look, <laughs> those things are not, in, in a sense, very different. They, they depend on the, the opportunity set you have um, at the time with, with the non-trend strategies. So th this is the level that um, we, we feel is appropriate now. Um, but it's also important to you know, fix a level so that investors know what, they, what they're going to get and we're not uh, messing around with it. Yeah. I wanted to touch on speed. And I, I saw a paper on, on your own website there recently, which goes into the kind of what you've alluded to a little bit. You talk about how returns in, in trend following degraded over time but that was very specifically in this paper in for short or fast trend following um and obviously you know you could consider fast trend following some of the other guests have alluded to the, the attraction of having some faster systems from the perspective of those turning points you know what, what's your perspective on you know how fast to, to apply trend following from 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 those two uh, perspectives of absolute return versus uh, being, being a bit more reactive at those equity turning points well, the analysis I, th I think you're alluding to um, looks at the performance of trend following over time for different speeds, d different lookbacks of trend following. And you're absolutely right that the, um, the largest deterioration is seen in the faster trend strategies. This is what everyone was trading. It was what Winton was trading when it, when it started in 1997. Um, and many people traded after that as well uh, for, for interesting reasons sometimes. And you, you definitely see a marked deterioration there. And then with the slower strategies, um, like you say, you, you don't see such a strong decline in their performance. But on the other hand, they started out with a lower sharp ratio uh, to begin with. So um, if you are always taking the speed that you believe has the highest sharp ratio, then you see that decline you know, as a result of those, uh, th those two effects. You know, in terms of uh, what's the right speed to choose, at any given moment, there are different objectives. So if you're trying uh, to purely maximize the, the sharp ratio, um, then uh, what our analysis has shown is that you really want to be very slow. But um, it, it's not the case that in general, um, investors are trying to maximize the sharp ratio of their trend allocation in, in isolation. Um, and that's, that's particularly clear when you think about what people want from it in, in a situation like last year or in, in 2008. You don't want to, to hang on to long equity positions uh, for a really, really long time and lose money um, just because um, it, it's, it's a very slow strategy. So there is some benefit um, in, in being faster there in that it, it ends up fitting uh, the investor objectives better, e even if the, the overall sharp ratio is slightly reduced over time. Fair enough. Um, just moving on into the, the kind of the research uh, process more generally, and, and you gave a sense of this at, at the outset in terms of um, the application of, of scientific techniques. Um, maybe can you give us a sense on how that research process starts and ends from the perspective of, you know, how might a new idea uh, get researched? Um, where would it come from in the first place? Is it from market observation, academic journals, um, and then for, from, um, you know, what, what are you looking for in, in terms of assessing, testing that idea uh, and bringing it as, as a potential strategy into the portfolio? Sure, yeah. I mean, it won't surprise you to hear that we're pretty open-minded about where ideas can come from. Um, the um, one place we, uh, we haven't uh, uh, looked so much recently, though, is, is in academic journals, actually. Um, we just don't think that's the forefront of, um, of research into alpha sources. But th this is why we've got a very large research department. Um, it's, it's because we, we intend to do original research um, ourselves. Often it, it's come from uh, surprising places. So we have um, uh, an office in China and, and sometimes when, when they've looked at Chinese commodities, um, it's turned out that an idea um, that they've applied there um, and come up with themselves actually works in the global context as well. Um, so it, it's often not what, not what you're expecting or looking at any given moment. Interesting. And <clears throat> I mean, are they, you know, is, is that anything from kind of uh, observations around su su supply demand dynamics in, in individual markets to reassessing, uh, you know, speeds or, uh, or I mean, is, it, is, it, it can, is, is that kind of anything at all or can you give a bit more color as to, you know, 
specific uh, kind of improvements uh, and strategies that have, that have come in? Sure, yeah. I, I mean, there are two uh, different types of research projects there that you mentioned. One is finding a new alpha source um, where you've really got to think of a new idea or you know a new, a new data input that you could potentially be using. Um, the other is um, you've got your existing alpha sources and you need to make sure you're doing them as well as you can. Um, and that involves uh, reviewing things like the uh, the speed of trend following or other aspects of the way you construct your trend signal, uh, your volatility models, and and so on. Very often um, with these things, you learn from the market environment that you're that, that you're living through, and often adjustments to our um, our volatility models, for example, have been uh, prompted by n new types of events. Um, you know, the events um, in, in February 18, uh, for example, were not so bad for us because we had lived through a very similar event in February 2007, which actually resembled the, the 2018 behavior quite strongly with the rising equity markets on relatively low volatility, uh, followed by a sudden sharp uh, reversal, which then, um, although people often focus on equities, was replicated across the space of markets that CTAs happen to be trading. So it looked like a, a crowding effect um, because it, it, it was a reversal that hit CTA positions specifically. Um, but we learned from that and we adjusted our models in, in 2007 um, and that protected us to some degree um, in 2018 when a, when a very similar thing happened. Um, so you know, that's one of the most important ways that uh, we end up um, getting the idea of changing our models in a particular way. Um when you see a, like a market event like that, or maybe if you look at say March twenty twenty is another example where you know really fast trend actually did very well, uh, kind of breakout models did well, having you know kind of models which had struggled maybe in the previous decade did well in in that period. So when you see something like that, how do you assess that? Would you need to see? You know, for, what, what would you need to see to say, oh, maybe something's changing with markets. Maybe we do need to learn something as opposed to saying, well, that was just uh, just one occurrence uh, in, 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 in the distribution of possible occurrences. So it's another thing to, to change. Well, that's a great question. You did have that period in, in February um, and March 2020 where faster trend following temporarily did, did better than slower trend following. And it's not hard to understand why. You know, markets uh, fell for exactly a month, pretty much, between that last week in February and the point where the, the Fed intervened uh, towards the end of March. If you um, turned around your positions and were short two weeks in, then you spent two weeks making money as the markets continued to fall. If, on the other hand, you took a month to turn around your positions, then you lost all the way down and then you lost again on the way up when you were short and the, and the markets were rallying. So that was a moment where, where faster trend following outperformed slower trend following. And then the question is, um, at that moment, has something changed? Is faster trend following going to continue to, to outperform slower trend following? And um, we didn't see any evidence that that had taken place, that there had been any kind of change there. And in fact, that's turned out to be right. Since then, slower trend following has once again done, done better than, uh, than faster trend following. The, the question that um, then comes up when you, when you follow this line of thought is, okay, so let's suppose that's right, that still slower trend following is the better bet in the long run, but occasionally you get these moments where faster trend following does well. Is there anything you can do in the moment to, uh, to be fast just then, say something about the regime? And our point of view is that um, uh, it's not the, uh, the role of a systematic manager to do that. And you, you can sort of see why, if you imagine yourself going through this, we all did go through this, so it's, it's not too hard. You imagine that you're long equities and you're a slow trend follower, and now you're two weeks into the market falling, right? So you're still long, but you could think to yourself, well, should I speed up for this regime? Should I, should I speed up? And then I'll be short now. So if it continues for another two weeks, I'll, I'll do well. And obviously what happened in reality was that the Fed stepped in after two weeks. But now think about yourself at that moment. You don't know that that's going to happen. So you're two weeks into this fall, and here are some possibilities. One is that the Fed could step in now. Another is that the Fed could step in in two weeks. Another is that the Fed might not step in. Or well, they might do it in a very long time. In the first situation, if they step in now, then you're making the wrong decision if you speed up because the markets will rally and you'll, be, you'll now be short. In the second situation, which is what actually happened, it would be the right decision. And in the situation where they don't step in, well, it's probably all about the same because eventually everyone will catch on to there being a big downward trend. So the point there is that you can see that this 
apparently technical statistical decision about which is the best speed, at that moment amounts to just a call on what the Fed is going to do and when. And hopefully it's clear that that's not the right call that um, systematic managers uh, should be making. There are managers who, who are experts in that, in, in predicting what the Fed will do. If you go to a discretionary macro manager for that kind of, uh, kind of decision-making, um, but it's not what you should expect from a trend follower, in our view. Okay. I mean, that's probably a good segue into a, 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 another research topic, which is, which is around machine learning. And I guess the kind of the hope with machine learning is that the machine can learn from different environments and, and, and assess what kind of regime and if markets change over time, adapt to that. Is that a re- is that a good is that is that a reasonable summary of what machine learning uh, hopes to be and and how successful do you think it has and can be? I don't know. I think different people have different hopes uh, for it. it. It's obviously a collection of of quite fascinating techniques which have been applied all over the place uh, in the world, and so it's um, extremely tempting to try and apply them here too, because after all, you know, they rely on having lots of data as an input, and they do apparently amazing things that are, are very difficult for for humans to arrange. Uh, themselves. So why would you not want to apply it? The thing is that um, machine learning algorithms require a lot of data, uh, a lot of training data uh, to, um, uh, to train them and, and, and to make them function well. And um, how much training data do you, do you really have in, in this context? The answer actually depends on the speed at which you trade. If you are trading relatively slowly, then there is only a few uh, uh, examples of the kind of events you're living through, um, because you d- you don't care about what the markets do from one minute to the next. You care about what it does over the time horizon in which you can change your position. And there usually isn't enough data to make machine learning a useful tool. On the other hand, um, when you look at much faster trading strategies, as as we do separately in our research process, then it becomes a very useful collection of techniques, um, because suddenly you have much more data for, for these algorithms to work with. We've uh, we put a paper out a, a while ago where we, we distinguished um, different styles of scientific analysis in a way. You have observational sciences like astronomy, and then you have experimental sciences uh, like particle physics. The difference is that in observational sciences, you can't arrange a new experiments. If you want to study black holes, you just have to work with the ones that are there that you can see. You can't, you can't create a new one uh, for your own purposes. Whereas in particle physics, you can create a new particle accelerator and you can repeat the experiment as, as many times as you've got money for and then get more and more data. And something like that is true in this kind of research too, in financial markets. If you're talking about what happens on slower timescales, how you deal with events like um, a market crash, well, you can't just create a market crash on demand. Uh, you have to study the ones that happened and try and, and learn from, from them as best you can. But if you're looking at something like... Um, uh, a very fast execution algorithm or something that's operating um, uh, very quickly in today, then you have lots of opportunity to try out different things, see how it works, and then iterate over and over again. So different styles of analysis are appropriate in different cases. And machine learning is definitely appropriate for the, um, the faster um, intraday strategies where you have more data to work with, and it's not appropriate, at least we haven't found a way to make it uh, so useful for the uh, slower types of strategies uh, that we've been discussing. Yeah, I just wanted to stay with this topic a little bit um, because it's fascinating. I wanted to ask you, Simon, something that I think we've, we probably haven't asked enough uh, so far in our series, and that is the parameter selections that you make uh, across the markets you trade. Um, do you trade universal parameters, meaning the same for all markets, or do you have different parameters depending on the kinds of markets you trade? And then my second question would be, how do you select parameters in general? Meaning, is there some kind of human element in it or is it completely automated? How often do you kind of change them? I'm just curious about that side of things. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're fairly universal, but but not not completely. There are practical differences often between, uh, between markets, uh, which you have to take account of. Some are more expensive to trade. Um, some have different cost structures. Some, you know, the market impact is a bigger concern. In others, they have intrinsically wider spreads, um, um, and, and that is a bigger component of the costs, and, and sometimes uh, commissions are a bigger component of the costs. So this um, sometimes requires you to, to choose different parameters uh, in different cases. In terms of how you select the parameters, though, that's a fascinating question, because um, 
obviously we're a systematic firm or, you know, almost all of our processes are highly automated and we try to automate everything we can. But there's always this boundary of uh, processes where you think, should that be automated or should that be done by a human? Parameter selection is, is one of them. You know, the overall leverage uh, a given strategy takes is, is, is another one. Choosing to put in a new signal, that, that's another thing. And um, there's a temptation as a, um, as a quant to say, everything's automated. I don't do anything. The whole, the, the whole thing's done by a computer. That's definitely the wrong thing to do. That's, that's an application of responsibility over the investment management process. And you, you can sort of see that because if you don't decide what the parameters are, then something else is going to. It's going to be an algorithm for deciding the parameters. Is there only one algorithm for deciding parameters? No, there's an infinite number of possible algorithms for deciding parameters. Which one are you going to use? Well, you've got to decide that. Are you going to decide that or are you going to have an algorithm to decide the algorithm which decides the parameters? How, how far back does, does this go? So how far back should it go? The answer is not entirely obvious. The question can be rephrased as, at what level do you want humans to take responsibility? Do you, do you want to say, I'm responsible for choosing this, this parameter? Or do you want to say, I'm responsible for choosing this algorithm which chose that parameter? Now, which is the right answer there? Uh, depends a bit on, on, on precisely what we're talking about. Sometimes it's a good idea to use an optimizer which does some of the other selection for you, and, and sometimes it isn't. It depends on what impact that's going to then have on the portfolio, how, mu how much it's going to impact your ability to understand what the portfolio is doing. You obviously don't want to have a black box where you, you delegate everything and you, you have a hard time understanding why the, um, why the system is taking the, uh, the choices it's taking. Our point of view has generally been that we try to push responsibility on the human fairly early. So things like the trend following speed, things like the allocation to individual assets, uh, we, are, we say are human decisions. They're made with, with input from analysis, um, from, uh, you know, with, with the usual scientific rigor, but they are, are things that humans sign off on. Interesting. I mean, very actually fascinating because I think it also gives um, insight to why trend followers are not the same, right? We all have our own little um, interpretations of uh, what is the right approach to some of these uh, seemingly maybe uh, to some small um, small parts of a bigger puzzle, but actually even the small parts uh, can be quite uh, important. So I appreciate that. Uh, great insight. Um, now, uh, another thing that um, came uh, around last year that I'd love to hear your thoughts about a little bit is a, a, a CTA replication. From my memory, I don't think you run any CTA replication type strategies, but a lot of people do. Some people for internal purposes, other people as their flagship program, so to speak. So I, I wanted to just hear your thoughts about, in particular, the replication type that has come out uh, recently, um, which is not a trend model, but rather just a, I say just, but it's a, a kind of a, a regression analysis of, of returns of managers, because I want to better understand um, what the risks uh, might be, and I'm not a quant, so I can't uh, really uh, judge that, but I'd love to hear different opinions about what the risks might be so that at least investors can be informed about these choices. Because clearly you could say, yeah, there's always going to be a manager risk. We can get things wrong, and occasionally some of us do. But there must also, in my view, must be some be some kind of replicator risk somewhere. Um, so I'd love to hear your, your thoughts about this. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I know that they... Um, uh, they try to put out the view that they mitigate single manager risk. Um, I, I, I don't really uh, agree with that. I mean, I think they are a single manager. If you want to mitigate a single manager risk, then obviously the fund of funds approach is the way to go. That obviously has its own pros and cons. So it, it's you know it's not that that's a universal good, um, but it, ha it has its role. Um, I haven't looked too closely at at the the ETF you're talking about though. I mean. How much do they charge? Is is it very cheap? Uh, it's about just shy of 1%. It's a little bit different depending on where you look. Sometimes it says 85 basis points. Sometimes it says another 10 basis points for dividend payments. So then max it 95. So let's call it just shy of 1% uh, as as a charge. And, and I guess some managers out there offer trend even cheaper than that, which of course I'm not necessarily 
in favor of giving our you know our great products or and strategies away um, at very low cost because I think it's it's not as simple as, as as people may think it is if you give it away cheaply but but that's a different discussion so yeah well yeah I'm, I'm sorry to tell you we, we offer our major markets trend strategy with daily liquidity for 80 basis points um so okay. it, I guess there you go <laughs> you know it's it's not clear then what the advantages of a of a copy from a regression when you when you can invest in the original exactly yeah sure Anyways, uh, one other thing that um, I, I'd love to hear before we uh, Alan jumps in, and that is just kind of, I, I guess you are in the camp of believing that more markets are, are better. Uh, is that a fair uh, conclusion? And and, um, and and if it is, I, I've often sort of looked at different managers where I kind of know that some managers trade a certain, you know, the classical liquid markets, maybe 50, 60 of them. And then other managers, clearly we know there have been people out there trading, you know, hundreds of markets. You could be one of them. I don't, I don't, I don't really know, uh, honestly. But I don't really see a big difference in long-term performance. I see it, it performs different at different times, but I don't really see a huge difference in long-term performance uh, as such. What are your observations, and 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 why why do we need to trade two or three hundred markets, for example? Well, we're definitely in the camp that you know, more diversification, more opportunity to capture trends is is better. I, I don't really agree with you that there's no, been no difference in the performance. So when you look at the performance in the alternative markets over the last decade. Um, it's outperformed major markets by by a long way. Last year was really, you know, the first year that that wasn't substantially true. And that uh, decade uh, after the financial crisis where Trendpoint didn't do so well, that was not shared by the alternative markets portfolio. They did, they did extremely well in that period. Um, I think, uh, you know, often you've heard, I mean, I think, you know, one of your other guests um, pointed to the fact that the Sharp ratio increases like the square root of of the number of markets you trade. As, you know, as evidence that the marginal benefit of adding another market is not very big. The reason that's not right is that the the number that goes into that square root is not the number of markets you trade, but the effective number of markets when you take an account of all of the correlations between them. And you know, obviously, if you trade a hundred markets that are identical, you haven't really got a hundred markets. You you got one market. And the truth is, you know, with the fifty or sixty markets that you're talking about, there are very large correlations between them. You know, most of the equity indices. Are very very highly correlated with one another, even if they're in geographically different regions. And the same goes for the bond futures, many of the commodities, and so on. So there aren't really fifty or sixty independent markets um, in that group. That there might be eight to ten, um, depending on how exactly you calculate it. And so the marginal benefit from adding more, which are genuinely different, is is really very great. So you can see it in that way mathematically. You can see it more straightforwardly if you just look at what happened in the last couple of years. Last year was great everywhere, but you know, the year before that uh, was okay for major markets. But look at the gigantic trends in the European gas markets and the European power markets. Um, these are things that there was no way to access. UK, you know, natural gas where we're sitting went up by a factor of 10, which I think is the largest trend I've ever seen in, in a futures market in, in that space of time. So there definitely are huge diversification benefits and huge trend opportunities you know, from adding the, you know, the, this particular collection of markets. Yeah, no, I, I, I appreciate that. And I think it's fine, uh, absolutely, um, to, uh, to uh, pinpoint kind of these differences in, in, in that. And I do agree with you. There certainly has been a couple of uh, products out there that are more focused on the alternative markets that for a period of time did better. Um, so, so no doubt about that. But I just wanted for clarification purposes, say when I was talking about a 50, 60 market portfolio, I was actually talking about the classical markets where you have a lot of diversification because it includes a lot of the commodities. But then if you go from 100 to 200, you know, except if you go into really alternative Chinese, et cetera, type of markets, a lot of the additional markets you see often are, as you say, financial markets that may have correlations to other markets um, that you may already have. So so I also uh, 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 appreciate that. We, we agree on that point, I think. Yeah, I, I, I certainly, this is one of the points of, of uh, disagreement we have with um, some of the other people who also trade a lot of markets, um, which is that the markets that you add have to genuinely be alternative and additive. And um, it's it's easy to get fixated on the number and, and try and win the competition of who has the most number of markets, 
But like you say, you don't want to do that by adding things like, um, I don't know, equity sector ETFs or, or developed market interest rate swaps, which are really very highly correlated. They're either, they're either super easy to access or they're very highly correlated with things that are, are vanilla and that you already trade. Um, so our effort there is to focus on the things that are genuinely diversifying. You mentioned Chinese futures. We trade a lot of them. We've, we've, we've traded them for, for, for many years onshore in China. And we, we trade them now. Um, via the internationalized markets, via swaps, and via the QFI route, you know, for our um, global investors. Um, so that that's definitely one area where you see a lot of uh, diversification benefit, and we've seen a lot of trends. But like I mentioned, also the, you know, the regional gas markets, the regional power markets, freight markets, marine fuel, all, all of these things have been tremendously additive over, over the last few years. Yeah, no, absolutely. Just on that topic, final question, because I think since you are uh, definitely people have been uh, in those markets very early on, you know, our industry came from, you know, this, um, the, the roots at least that, you know, we trade on, on, on liquid and exchange traded markets. I, I imagine that some of the alternative markets are not on exchange per se, and you have to access, access them in a different uh, way. How, where, how do you, how do you balance the choice of maybe an additional benefit from performance, but maybe you could say, I don't know what the word I'm looking for right now is, but but maybe the drawback of, of not being on exchange and, and taking on counterparty risk and, and, and other things. How, how, do you, how do you look at that when you decide to, to add more markets? How, how important uh, are these things? That's a great question. I, I think um, there, there are several parts to the answer. So the, the first is that although it's true that most of the liquidity of these markets is not on exchange, most of the trading is not on exchange, there's still markets that, where you can clear your position uh, on the exchange. So you can um, really reduce the counterparty risk to you know, close to the level with major futures markets, um, which, which is a big, a big point. You can't always do that, but, but very often you can. But there's another way of phrasing, you know, or another aspect to it, which you could have asked, which is um, that these markets are, by definition, have a barrier to entry. And that's, you know, one of the reasons why they have extra alpha is because it hasn't been so easy for speculative trend followers to just uh, extend uh, automatically in their strategies into them. So it, it places a burden on the organization and you have to structure uh, your trading team and your, uh, your middle office team and so on uh, to absorb these without requiring um, uh, a huge scaling up of the number of people there. This is um, a big effort in software and in, and in automation, and it's something that we've we've paid a lot of attention to. It's um, it's work, but it's also the reason why the whole thing works. So it's worth doing. Yeah, no, uh, th those are great points. I appreciate that. Alan, where do you want to go next? Um, maybe just to talk about um, the, the the role of these strategies in the context of a broader portfolio. Um, I guess, you know, obviously a lot of what we've heard about talking to Simon and also other managers is, you know, the difficulty of keeping people invested in these types of strategies. So that's why smoothing can, can be beneficial. From the perspective of, of having an, an alternatives allocation within, you know, a multi-asset portfolio, be it a 60-40 or something else, is there, you know, one, would that be more trend focused? Would that make sense to be more trend focused for that allocation? Uh, would it be pure trend? And, um, you know, what about considerations or that, that you see with other managers that it might make sense to, say, cap the equity beta of that trend program uh, when it's be, definitely been used as part of a multi-asset portfolio? Well, those are great questions. I mean, in a sense, they're the, they're the key questions for, for investors, uh, in a way, rather than managers, because the answers depend on what the investor's objectives are, what their tolerance is for, for drawdowns in, in particular parts of their book, what their process is for um, reassessing their existing allocations. If you can say, um, I know that trend following has these characteristics, the, these drawdowns, and your process allows you to, um, to withstand those through time, then uh, a pure trend allocation is really good. And people who've made pure trend allocations and held on to them for the long run have done really well. But you know, like I said before, that's not always possible, and it's not always possible for entirely sympathetic reasons, and it just depends on on the nature of the organisation. So it's very hard to give a you know a hard and fast rule and say you know trend following deserves this or that allocation um, in a portfolio. 
Um, you, you have to have those individual conversations. Sure. Uh, what we've heard from some other managers is, as you say, that I mean, there's a, a recognition of about these trade-offs, that but increasingly the investor is is kind of being asked to choose themselves. What's uh, and, and and managers are in some ways becoming more kind of like solutions providers. Is that the approach you've taken? I mean, can, do, do you customize portfolios specifically for for clients? On, on based on requirements or is it that you have a discussion and then decide well what's the, the mix of your, your existing programs well we do customize programs i mean pe people have all kinds of different uh, requirements it's often um less about the amount of trend than about the amount of uh alternative markets for example um or the, the amount of the chinese markets and, and so on um obviously having uh multiple products makes it very straightforward to do this because people can just allocate some to each product and then it doesn't require uh, you to add a whole new bespoke elements to to, to the setup fair enough um you mentioned uh, you know how a lot of these markets are now particularly in the alternatives that you can kind of clear centrally r r mitigate the, the counterparty risk so maybe just to, to talk a little bit about the, kind of the big risks that you worry about obviously you know you're monitoring the the, the risk profile of the of the program in terms of I guess you already touched on kind of the, the leverage etc but what would you say are the kind of the the, the the qualitative risks that that you think are to the fore of your mind uh, when when you're running these types of portfolios. Well, like the way we think about risk management, perhaps is a bit different from from others as well. So th there's a um, a strange confusion that afflicts the CTA industry particularly, which is to uh, equate risk with volatility, and it's to the extent that very often if you know when a manager is asked what is your risk level, they will just reply with their their volatility level, and it it only you know, it can start to feel natural almost, um, but when you step outside of this for a moment, it's totally bizarre, right? If you think about 2017, when equities were going up in a straight line and the VIX was at a record low, you know, was there anyone in the world who thought that equity risk was at a record low? You know, and no one seriously thought that. And if, if you talk to any equity investor and said, oh, why don't you think risk is low? Look how low the VIX is. They would have pointed you to the fact that, you know, the VIX can increase very suddenly, they would have also pointed to valuations and they would have said valuations are looking extremely rich. So what, what, does, that, what does that mean? So why do, why do we end up uh, in, in this segment of the investing world focusing on vol? It's it, you know, a strange story. It, it probably comes from the fact that actually estimating the risk, the risk of a loss, which is what everyone cares about, is, is incredibly hard. Whereas the, the problem of estimating your current volatility is, is relatively easy. So we try and avoid that mistake. How do we do it? Well, you, you look at what equity investors were saying and they were saying valuations were rich. What they're really saying is, uh, okay, I can look at the VIX, but then there are all these other numbers I can calculate which tell me that actually risk is quite high right now. So you have to treat the volatility in the same way. You treat volatility as one number that tells you something about risk, but it's only one and there are many, many other things you should be looking at. You already mentioned leverage as, as another thing. Um, but it's quite important to look at, at different scenario tests and, and different stress tests. And now this comes back to your question, well, which, which scenarios should you be looking at? Uh, that's an, another way to ask, what are you worried about right now? You don't want to restrict yourself to just the things that you happen to be able to think of at the moment. That, that's not a very systematic approach to it. So what we often do is we, uh, we look at our current positions and we see uh, how they would have performed in all the previous market environments that we have data for. We say, what's the worst day or the worst week that we would have experienced with our current exposures? And then we say, well, that's something that did happen. And so by definition, it is realistic. It can happen again. And how would we feel if we lived through that? You know, are we taking an excessive amount of risk? Uh, you know, when you then put it into that context. And often this brings up things that you're not necessarily thinking about. So, for example, in 2014 when oil was declining, this was saying, well, what happened in 1990 when the first Gulf War started? Oil jumped by 30%. Don't think that that couldn't happen right now. It could happen. And then what would happen to your portfolio if it did? So how are things looking right now? Well, right now, most things are short bonds and, and long equities. So obviously, the, um, the situation that's really worrisome is a very classic risk-off move where bonds rally and equities um, decline at the same time. That's not the behavior that we've been seeing recently from equities and bonds. We've been seeing sort of modest positive correlation between those asset classes. 
And um, obviously the dynamic with um, with inflation has made that somewhat different from the usual situation where people just buy bonds when um, as a risk off asset. Um, but nevertheless, it's not impossible that that could happen. There could be um, there could be some news which is both uh, disinflationary and negative for the economy. Um, and then you might see exactly that. You might see a bond rally and, and equities fall, and that's exactly what would be worse for the current portfolio. So that's the kind of scenario that we worry about now. Okay. So so that th- those kind of scenarios then, presumably then, does that cause you maybe to re- reduce leverage um, relative to what, what you would have otherwise? Is that the point? Yeah, it can do. I mean, the, the way that these strategies operate, the leverage naturally fluctuates as the signal strength varies and the correlation between markets varies. And the question you have for yourself is, do you want to maintain it in a particular band or are you happy at the moment with it being below that or perhaps above that? And that then depends on what these other risk measures are telling you. Yeah, Can I jump in with a non-scientific question here, Simon? Because what you're saying makes perfect sense, of course. But I'm thinking... I mean, couldn't you always think of a scenario that would go against all of your positions in the major asset classes at the same time? I mean, is how how do you deal with that in a sense that yeah, it could either force bonds to go down and and equities to go up or vice versa or move in the same direction and 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 so, you know, how do we, how do we balance that kind of risk that we we are being so cautious because it could happen? No, that's right. But we're not just sort of imagining a scenario that could go against the portfolio. We're we're looking at scenarios that have happened in the past and seeing what's the worst case that we would have experienced with the current portfolio. I mean, you're obviously right. I mean, you know, if you start off from the point of view of what's the worst that could happen, the answer is always going to be that everything goes to zero and you you lose everything. That's that's just not very helpful because you, you need these scenarios you're looking at to be realistic in some way. But by definition, anything that has happened is realistic because it did happen. True. And and so here's another non-scientific question. I completely agree with that in a sense that, you know, history is a good guide. But but I've also heard very smart people say, well, what we really should worry about are things that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> so I'm wondering, do you also have like a, a scenario for, for things that hasn't happened yet, but could be quite um, meaningful in terms of either up or down for that matter in, in, in terms of performance? Yeah, look, we, we have other... Um, other scenarios which are more stylized in nature. So you look at things like, what if uh, all the correlations change in whatever way would be worst for you? And that, that was actually a very helpful scenario in 2013 um, because prior to the taper tantrum, um, trend followers were long bonds and long stocks. The correlation was negative. So people who were, like most of the industry, fixated on volatility were very highly leveraged. And at the time, we were not. And the, re- the reason we were not was that we looked at precisely that scenario. What happens if that correlation goes positive and they both go down? And that looked like it was um, an unacceptably large level of risk. So we temporarily operated at a lower level of volatility. And that, that really helped us, actually, in that year. Okay. Oh, well, that's great. That's, that's, that's exactly what I was trying to to get to. Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of questions that actually were sent in to, uh, to us by, by a large allocator uh, after having listened to some of the uh, episodes. I'm not going to go through all of the questions, but there were a couple of them that I thought was quite interesting. First off, uh, uh, he asks, if the ultimate objective of investing in trend following is to improve the compounding of your multi-asset portfolio while having tolerable drawdowns, he's asking, should you then cap the trend follower's ability to go long equities? And I'm sure you can work out why, why that is. Do you think that's sensible or, or not? Uh, look, again, I think it, it it depends on what the overall investor objectives are. So you, you can... Um certainly do that. You reduce the long-term performance uh, to some extent, depending on how big, the, you know, how significant the cap is. And some people look at that and think that's good. Other, other people, uh, other people uh, look at that and think, well, that's missing out an opportunity. And, and in particular, um, you know, people who are more concerned about the sharp ratio and the overall performance and not just how it performs at, in, in crisis periods uh, might have that point of view. Um, so we have offered that as uh, as a bespoke arrangement to to investors that will will cap the beta, but um, it, it's very hard to say one is objectively better or worse than the other. Sure, sure. 
Yeah, no, I, I fully understand. The other question he has, uh, which I also thought is interesting uh, for uh, maybe a general uh, audience uh, of uh, institutional investors, at least, and that is, uh, how many trend following strategies do you really need in a portfolio? I mean, do you have you any any thoughts on on that? Do you mean in in our portfolio, or do you mean in, in an allocator? No, portfolio? I mean actually, uh, if if an allocator like an institution was putting together some exposure to trend followers. Uh, in general, uh, I mean, how many managers should they pick? Um, well, if, if it's Winston, then obviously only one. Um, and uh, if, in general, um, I, I look, this comes back to the point of single manager risk, and you can definitely see the point there that there's a trade-off, right? Because you can diversify and you reduce the single manager risk. And on the other hand, um, you don't have uh, fee netting. So um, you, know, you, you potentially um, uh, pay more in, in fees to do that. I th- I'm sure Alan will have a, have a strong point of view on this particular question, but uh, you know, to us, the, you know, that that trade-off is very clear, and you know, people just have to decide where they w- where they want to be on it. Alan, do you have a few last questions before I wrap up with the usual um, quick yeah, fire well, ones? Yeah, m- maybe just one final one. I mean, around kind of return expectations. Um, I mean, and and I think at the outset, Simon touched on kind of the how the sharp would maybe historically has been 0.5 or so in 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 trend following and you know we we have spoken to to other guests who've kind of done the research of the 100 years or the 200 years of trend following and have found that that return to be very stable i'm just curious in 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 terms of your in Simon's conversations with investors and when they're constructing portfolios and trying to think about return expectations is that is that is that the default way of saying, well, this is what it's done over the long term? So that's your best guess of what it might do going forward. Yeah, that's probably right. I mean, that those long term simulations are very interesting. I, I think they, the purpose they serve is is to persuade people who are um, still thinking about efficient markets theory. So what they show is that um, the underlying markets um, have had this trending behavior over the, over the very long term, and they haven't they haven't behaved efficiently. That is different from forming uh, a sharp ratio expectation for a, a real traded strategy because that depends on the number of people who are also trading the strategy in the futures markets right now. Um, so even looking back to the 70s, you know, when um, you can sort of start to have a reasonable strategy, including the currencies and so on, because you know, prior to that you have the Bretton Woods system, you see this change that we talked about in the performance over time. And it's it's clear that that, that correlates very strongly to the growth of people trading the strategy. and. Uh, like every other investment opportunity in the world, that you know, the more people who do it, um, the more they have to share out the uh, the returns among themselves. So, point five is our expectation based on all of the available evidence um, th- that we see, including um, what's happened over the last fifty years as the industry has grown, as the performance of different speeds has changed, where we think the best speed is to be right now. Okay, so yeah, so that's kind of takes into account all of that. Obviously, you've had. I suppose you could say you've got lower trading costs now that you might have had in the past, um, which would be a positive, and fees have probably come down for investors too. So I guess l- lots of kind of moving parts there. Um, but no, that, 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 that's, that's fair enough. Niels? Yeah, no, I just want to round off um, our conversation, Simon, with a couple of um, sort of shorter questions and um, not really related to specifically um, uh, what what you do uh, um, at, at Winton. And and the one, one of the questions that I always uh, ask is, what is the one thing you hear about trend following, so from other people, that you disagree with the most? And we've had a few different answers, some similar answers, but I'd love to hear your your thoughts on, on, on this question as well. Sure. Yeah, I think um, the thing that you know we most disagree with is is this idea that trend following is a, is a kind of dumb strategy that is just people following each other in in a in a herding crowd behavior. And in fact, uh, what's really interesting is that very often when trend following is most successful, it's because it's actually a contrarian strategy. So what I mean by that is um, maybe it's easy to look at a specific example. If you think about oil in 2014, the, the example I mentioned previously when it was falling because of the rise of shale production in the US. Um, And you look at what fundamental analysts were predicting for the price at the time, what you see is that no one was predicting the price would fall. And why was that? It was because the narrative at the time was around peak oil supply. At the time, you don't hear very often anymore, but that was very common then. And um, at the same time, 
Um, demand for oil was growing from emerging markets, you know, from China, from India, from Brazil, and so on. And so those combination of factors, it was felt meant that the price could never really go down because supply was dwindling, demand was increasing. What, what do you expect to happen? And uh, what you see is that no one really fully assessed the impact of, of the shale production increase. Trend following, the great thing about trend following is that it doesn't know about these theories about what's supposed to happen. It just says, well, the price has gone down. Let's, let's bet that it will continue to go down. And at that point, obviously, it's acting as a contrarian because it's betting against what everyone else thinks. And that is um, uh, that, that was an extremely successful trade. Now, why, why, why was that successful? It's because a trend um, is a situation where a price moves from one place to another place over an extended period of time. If, if the price jumps immediately, then that's not a trend. That, that, you, know, that you might get right or you might get wrong, but it's 50-50. For there to be a trend, the movement has to be extended in time. And often it can be extended um, because it is contrarian, because there's a narrative which people think means that the market needs to actually go in the other direction. Very similar thing was happening at the same time uh, in a totally different area, in, in German fixed income. Uh, so there, what was happening was that yields were getting lower and lower, and there was a widespread belief that, um, okay, the central bank could set negative interest rates if they wanted. That's a bit weird, but they could do it. Um, but who would give uh, money to the government for 10 years and, and get less of it back? So there was this belief that you could never have long-term yields be negative. And once again, trend following doesn't know about that. It doesn't care. It just says yields have been going down. That's better that they will continue to go down. And that long bonds trade was extremely good. And, and obviously what happened was those yields did go negative. And again, that contrarian attitude, because it was fighting against this narrative, it led to a very smooth trend. So very often, not always, but but very often, one of the great things about trend following is that it's actually a contrarian strategy. So that that's I think our point of view on on trend, which is different from you know what we what we often hear. Yeah, no, I love that actually. That, that those are great points. So I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, the final question I just wanted to to ask uh, is really kind of you know we are um, at an interesting time or um, point in time. Um, what are you most excited about when you uh, look a little bit ahead? And I don't mean performance, of course. I just mean what are you most excited about uh, uh, in general? And also, is there anything that you um, that gives you any source of uh, concern when it comes to our industry or our strategies type thing? Sure. Well, I think it's very well phrased. You know, we can't make predictions about short-term performance. Uh, what we're focused on is is what matters, and what matters is original research to find new alpha sources and you know improve our existing ones and on risk management. And um, you know, th those are exactly the two things you mentioned. So uh, we've got a, a really uh, exciting uh, research department and research process, and there's a, there's a huge amount going on uh, all the time, both in our trend, in our, in our systematic macro, and across our multi-strategy uh, hedge fund with the, the long-short equities and, and the credits as well. And at the same time, you know, our approach to risk management is, is, is the one I mentioned of you know, hypervigilance and uh, monitoring a whole array of possible scenarios and situations that, that could come up. Um, so that's that's what we think is important for 2023, and that, that's what we're going to continue to do. <laughs> Great way to uh, end our conversation, Simon. Um, thank you so much. It's been fascinating. It's been delightful. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast today and sharing those thoughts and your in and, and insights with us. And uh, we hope we can do this uh, again sometime in the future. And to all of you listening today, I hope you were able to take something from today's conversation onto your own investment journey. And if you did, please share these episodes with your friends and colleagues. From Alan and me, thanks so much for listening. We look forward to being back with you on the next episode of Top Traders Unplugged as we continue our deep dive into the CTA industry. And in the meantime, go check out the show notes for this episode and all the other resources you can find on our website. And not least, of course, Take care of yourself and take care of each other. Thanks for listening to Top Traders Unplugged. If you feel you learned something of value from today's episode, the best way to stay updated is to go on over to iTunes and subscribe to the show so that you'll be sure to get all the new episodes as they're released. We have some amazing guests lined up for you. And to ensure our show continues to grow, please leave us an honest rating and review in iTunes. It only takes a minute and it's the best way to show us you love the podcast. We'll see you next time on Top Traders Unplugged.